Hello there everyone, I'm UXW Bill and today we're doing something completely different. Usually when you tune into a cooking video on my channel, my wonderful, awesome, and totally cool mother is doing the cooking. But today we're turning things on their head, I'm going to do the cooking, and a little while later my mother's going to talk about computers and electronics. Okay, not really, but I am going to do the cooking, and what we're making today is called the Awesome Applesauce Cake. And it will be especially awesome because one of the ingredients is, of course, applesauce, but we're going above and beyond that with homemade applesauce from last year's round of canning. Isn't that totally cool? I certainly think it is. So here's what we have to do to start. We have to preheat the oven and make sure to grease it. We've already pretended to do that. We're not real big on preheating around here. We also have to butter some cake pans, but those are over there, and we'll, we'll do that a little bit later. Where we're going to start right now, with the cake, we're going to whisk together some flour, baking powder, I think that, yeah, this is baking powder. There's baking soda over here. Salt. This is William's salt, which is good. I was all prepared to get on my mother's case about using my salt, but since I'm doing the work, I guess that's on me. Um, we have eggs. But I don't think we put those in yet. Um, yeah, I'm reading this off of a sheet. Can you tell I'm really doing an exceptional job here so far? So what we're going to do is we're going to start with the flour. And as I think we've mentioned in the past, when you're working with flour, not only should you probably be mindful of your respiratory health and not wear clothing that you care about, but flour has a bad habit of developing air pockets. So when you go to dip out a cup of flour like I just did, you've got to make sure to break up those air pockets by doing this. Okay. Not only does that make a really cool noise, but it also ensures that you will not short yourself on flour. Now the recipe calls for two cups of flour, but we are doubling the recipe because we're going to make two of these cakes. So there's our first cup of flour, which we'll put in the bowl right there. And we'll go and get another one. Now, I told my mother earlier, when we were planning this out, that we had enough flour. I am kind of starting to wonder if that's actually true. So that is our second cup of flour. Nothing to it. Nothing to it but to do it. we we'll go in here, and we get a third cup of flour. And I think we are going to be able to make this work, but I will be pulling it off just by the skin of my teeth or the hair of my chinny chin chin since it's been a few days since I shaved. That's our third cup of flour. Now we'll go for our fourth. And when you buy flour, it comes in a paper bag, but you should store your flour in an airtight container like this because not only does that help to keep it fresh, it also keeps it from getting buggy and nothing will disappoint you faster than if you inadvertently prepare a whole recipe with buggy ingredients. As we did once, and we did not discover it until after we had baked said cake. Needless to say, that went right into the garbage. So there's four cups of flour. That's our first ingredient. The second ingredient that we will be using is the baking powder. It comes in a lovely little can like this. I think this is actually a flip open and measure top, but look at that, it's brand new. So we must take the top off, and, no it's not brand new, but we'll fold it back. And when you open one of these, you can actually leave this little seal partially on here, because it makes an excellent leveling device for your measuring spoons. So what we need now are two teaspoons. Now don't be like me and confuse a tablespoon with a teaspoon. There's a big difference, and your recipe will taste funny to say the least. Again, we're doubling this, so instead of just two teaspoons of baking powder, we're going to use four. And I'll show you how I'm going to level this off right here. Just very nicely, very evenly. We'll put that in there. That's our first teaspoon. That's our second teaspoon. That's a little too much. That's our third teaspoon. And there's our fourth teaspoon. Now don't worry if your measurements aren't precisely exact. I had a home ec teacher who was, shall we say, a bit insistent that everything just had to be measured with absolute precision. 
And truthfully, I suppose if you're cooking in an institutional setting, it should be. But we're doing this for fun in the comfort and privacy of our own homes. A little bit of extra or short ingredients is not going to cause your loaf of bread to fall in on itself or your cake to halt and catch fire in the oven. So we just put our baking powder in there. Now it's time for our baking soda. Baking soda is cheap and it has a million uses and once again when you open this you can arrange it such that you can use this to level off your measuring spoon. So how much baking soda do we need? Well we need one half of a teaspoon but since we're doubling this we're going to use one teaspoon. So we'll put it in there and again we'll level it off just like that. We'll try to do a little better job of leveling it off. Don't do this over your bowl of ingredients, by the way. You should not do that. Because if you inadvertently dump the whole box in there, you will feel really bad. So there's our baking soda. Now we need our salt. And here again, don't pour your salt over your bowl of ingredients, because it's all too easy to have a huge disaster with this. Again, the recipe calls for one half teaspoon of salt, but remember we're doubling it. So we're going to use one teaspoon. And then we'll level it off, and you can use your finger for this, and then you just put it in the bowl. Now we turn our attention to cinnamon, the first of many spices. Cinnamon was once considered a very prestigious spice, it had quite a bit of uh, monetary value associated with it. These days it's available in your grocery store. Here we need one and a half teaspoons of cinnamon. And we're doubling that though, so we're going to use three teaspoons. We'll get our first teaspoon out of there, and again we can use the lid in the container to help level it off. There's our cinnamon. There's one teaspoon. My mother was giving me a cue in the background saying that one and a half doubled is three. But, although technically I'm a, I am a millennial, I do know how to do basic math. So there's three teaspoons of cinnamon. Now the next ingredient would have ordinarily been nutmeg, but when I hold this up you'll see this says G-I-N-G-E-R. That is no way to spell nutmeg in any language. My mother is not particularly fond of nutmeg, so we're going to substitute ginger. Now this one is actually brand new, so we'll have to open it up. And I will try to exercise decorum and not use my teeth to open this. There we go. We'll leave the top off. I probably should have made, again, I probably should have made a little leveling ledge out of that label, but oh well, I didn't. They call for one half teaspoon of nutmeg. Again, we're doubling things, so we're going to use one teaspoon. And I'll try to level this off very carefully without spilling it all over the table. And I kind of succeeded. So there's the nutmeg. All right, now what we're going to do is we're going to whisk all of these ingredients together. And when we're done whisking them together, we're going to set them aside for a little while. We will, however, be coming back to these ingredients. The next process will involve bringing out some more ingredients that are actually liquids. We'll have softened butter, brown sugar, and vanilla. We'll also have an electric mixer, and who doesn't like to use an electric mixer? We're back, thanks to the magic of video editing, and now it's time for a different set of ingredients that we'll mix together separately from our dry ingredients. These are primarily wet ingredients, and one of the first ingredients that we will talk about, though not used quite yet, is the applesauce. Now, this is home canned, homemade applesauce. It is totally and completely awesome, but there is one thing that could severely infringe upon its awesomeness, and that is a loss of the vacuum seal that was done when we packed this. So if you make your own or buy it in the store, they always tell you on the store-bought stuff, make sure the button is depressed, that it doesn't click when you press it. That way we know that the seal is still intact and this is fresh and suitable for use. This seal is most definitely still intact. And that's good because you don't want to hurt the seal. In the words of the infamous and inimitable Red Green, if you hurt the seal, you'll have the Greenpeace people after you. So let's not do that. We use this quaint little item to go ahead and open it. There isn't much effort involved in that. And right away you'll notice that the applesauce is nowhere near as dark as it looks. That's because it's actually in a purple jar. I was wondering about that myself until just a moment ago when my mother mentioned that. I forgot that we have a motley assortment 
of interesting colored canning jars. But this particular quaint item, which you don't strictly have to have, is called a can opener. And when I was a child, I always thought that this red tip ought to light up, that there were batteries in here and this ought to light up. Of course, it never did, which led my two-year-old mind to think that maybe it was because the batteries were depleted. We were talking about that earlier. We don't have a great many flashlights around here that work. Oh, we have billions and billions of flashlights. But none of them actually work. My mother came across a mini mag light on the counter, turned it on, brilliant light came forth, and we almost had to call the CBS Evening News. So newsworthy was that item. Anyway, I'm getting way off the subject here, so let's get back to the subject at hand. We have two softened sticks of butter here. The recipe calls for one, but remember, we're doubling it, okay? So we've got those right there. We have our applesauce. Somewhere around here we have a jar of brown sugar, and we also have vanilla extract. There are two kinds of this. There's imitation, and there's the real stuff. We only use the best possible stuff around here. So this is the real deal. If your cooking goes completely wrong, although the taste of this is pretty strong and bitter, you can drink it because there is a considerable amount of alcohol in here. And that will make every kind of cooking go better if you're having any trouble. I personally do not drink alcohol because I used to be in network administration, and if I got started drinking, I would never stop. Anyway, let's go ahead and start with our softened butter. We can just go ahead and dump that in the bowl. One stick of it out of there. Okay, we have a spatula for that. I said I could do math earlier. I didn't say anything about being able to cook. But I do love to cook. It's just the fire department can't stand it when I do. So, all right, we have our softened butter. Now we need our brown sugar. And I'm not really sure how we're going to do this because getting a multi-cup measure in here, or even a cup measure in here, it's kind of like a St. Bernard trying to come in through the cat door. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, we are back, and my mother clued me in as to how you measure out the brown sugar from the jar, because right away you can see my worst suspicions were affirmed. You can't possibly get a whole cup measure in there. Fortunately, you just take your spoon, and you ladle it out. And unlike most other ingredients, you need to pack it in there. When you tip it over and dump it out, it should come out in the shape of the cup measure if you did it properly, as you can see right there. Now, you have probably noticed that here is our backdrop, instead of a kitchen tablecloth or anything like that, we have a white linen towel, pretty featureless expanse, at least it was before we started cooking. That is because when you do stuff like this, there's invariably going to be some spillover and you might make a mess. If you're not making a mess, you're probably not cooking, or at least you're not cooking properly. So, see to it that you rectify that immediately. There you go, I'm measuring out the brown sugar, and as you can see, I am making a mess, so I am most assuredly cooking. I am trying, however, not to make too much of a mess, because some ingredients are much more expensive than others. I might try to scoop a little of this up and just put on there to fill in the holes. Again, I've packed that in there pretty well, so we'll dump that in there. Okay. Now we need our vanilla extract. What did I do with the vanilla extract? If you don't lose at least 10 of your ingredients while you're cooking again, you're probably doing it wrong. This is brand new vanilla extract. It's got one of these easy pull labels on it that you need an end loader to remove. Again, I'm trying to be very civilized here and not using my teeth, and that's just not working <laughs> at all. Because you tear the little thing off and then you get a plastic underlayment and pretty soon you wonder why you even started doing this. Okay, so how much vanilla do we need? We have to look here. One teaspoon. The teaspoon is very popular, but again, we're doubling this, so we're going to use two. There's one teaspoon of vanilla. And coming right up will be our second teaspoon of vanilla. And now we have all of the ingredients for phase two. And this is where you get to channel your inner, inner Michael Jackson and beat it. Yes, I just said that with a straight face. This is a handheld mixer. If you can find a vintage one, they're great. The modern ones are garbage. They are underpowered. I remember using one in high school that couldn't even churn its way through frosting without stalling out and overheating the motor. But this thing is awesome. It also scares the dog, which makes it even more awesome in my book. We are to insert the beaters. And I always start the mixer slowly because at first you might fling ingredients around until they're fully blended with one another. So I'll start slowly, 
but as the ingredients start to combine, I'll speed the mixer up, and we're supposed to operate the mixer at high speed until our mix is pale and fluffy. And you can certainly tell that this mixer is coming under load, but it's working pretty well. I might need to periodically stop the mixer and kind of fold my ingredients back down into the bowl because as you saw some of them were trying to escape from bowl catraz. So we'll turn that back on and go again. This is a Sunbeam mixer from when the Sunbeam name actually meant something. as a burst of power function. Hello, every, hello everyone, <laughs> I'll get it out sooner or later. Hello everyone, we're back thanks to the magic of video editing once again, and it's time to add yet more ingredients. Yes, the ingredients are definitely having a great season this year, as opposed to the off season that they sometimes have when I start cooking. The next major ingredient that we're going to add are the eggs. Now the thing with eggs, is that they are a very natural product, and it's always good to work with nature. But the problem is sometimes, as with other natural products, because honey is the only food that never spoils, you can sometimes get a bad egg. So when you go to add your egg, eggs to the recipe, don't add them directly into it, because again, if you have one bad egg, you will just have wasted all of those ingredients, and you don't want to do that. You'll make yourself very, very mad if you do that. So take your bowl that you melted your butter in previously, and just crack your eggs there. I'll move this aside so you can see it a little bit better. And we'll just crack the egg. Sometimes I find that it works better to actually rotate it a little and crack it twice. Okay, so there's our first egg, and our first egg is good. So we'll set our eggshells aside. You can actually put the eggshells in the garden later to make things more fertile for your future crop. Now, we're going to add the eggs one at a time. And, of course, an egg is very scientifically and technically composed of a little yellow orb, and the rest is icky gross. So we'll take our mixer and we'll put it in there, and that egg has been naughty, so once again we're going to channel our inner Michael Jackson and beat it. And as the eggs are beaten into the mix, we will add more of them. Did you shut me off? We'll lay our mixer on its back, and it's time for another egg. When you crack your eggs, make sure to look for any traces of shell. Now you might see something odd in your egg, like a little white piece or something like that. That's not any cause for concern. But if you saw gangrene in there or something, throw that egg away and get another one. Now it's time for our third egg. your hands will get very, very eggy while you're doing this, but that's okay. You'll wash. Now it's time for our fourth and final egg. And all four of these eggs were good. In fact, in all the years 
that I have been cooking with my mother and watching my mother cook, I don't think I've ever seen a bad egg. So the odds are, in, a, in my opinion, infinitesimal, but they could exist. You've just caught me in the midst of getting ready to dump in the remainder of the applesauce. We actually had to go and get another jar of it. We needed three cups total. There's one and a half in here now. There's one and a half over here. So I'm going to go ahead and add the rest of this. And then I'll use my cute little spatula to go ahead and clean the bowl out thoroughly because quite a lot of the applesauce tends to stick behind. And we don't want that. We don't want to waste it. Especially since it's the last applesauce part of the last applesauce that we have. This year we did not can any applesauce. Although we do have some apples on the porch, we haven't even so much as looked at them. And of course canning season is pretty well over at this point. Our own apple trees did not really yield anything that impressive this year. So now we're going to take our mixer, put it in here once again and start it on low speed, and we're just going to gently mix all this together. And right about now, if you're thinking at all like I do, you're probably getting ready to imitate that little chihuahua that Taco Bell used in their commercials for many years. And you're going to say, I think I need a bigger bowl. I probably should have used this bowl for the liquid ingredients and this for the dry. But it's not hardly the end of the world. Look at how nicely all that's mixing together. Now it's time to go ahead and add our flour to this liquid mix. Now as I mentioned earlier, I kind of messed up here because I should have used the larger bowl for the liquid ingredients and the smaller bowl for the flour. Now I have kind of a problem, but it's not the end of the world. I can solve this relatively easy easily by taking small portions of the flour and mixing in here. And when I have this bowl pretty close to being full, I'll just go ahead and pour it into here. Shouldn't be a problem. So we'll start out with about a half cup of the dry ingredients. And we'll put them over here, kind of sprinkle them around a little bit. Then I'll get my lovely mixer and we'll just mix them in. And when it looks like the dry ingredients have mixed in well with the wet ingredients, I'll go ahead and I'll get another small amount of the dry ingredients. And I can try to do this one different activity in each hand. This is kind of like patting your stomach and rubbing your head. They say it's impossible, but I had plenty of time in uh, various day camps years ago to perfect the technique. This is kind of the same thing here. We'll just gently add this in. When I was younger, my, my mother used to refer to me as really KitchenAid hands. I think you can see why. If I were any better at this, I'd have to start my own home economics related magazine. We've come to the point now where I've managed to fill my small bowl with as much flour as I could possibly mix in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and I'm going to dump it in the bowl with the flour. And that didn't go too badly. Then I'll take my little rubber spatula here, my scraper, and I'll scrape out the inside of the bowl pretty thoroughly. And while we're doing that, I'll tell you about garnish. Yes, you can actually add a little bit of excitement, a little bit of flair to your awesome applesauce cake. You can make it even more awesome. It's like awesome times awesome, awesome squared, awesome cubed. Okay, I'm not really much of a student at math at all. The basic four is pretty much it for me. But what you could do, you could add raisins, although it's my opinion that raisins should never ever be put in baked goods you could also put in some nuts. What we happened to find in the refrigerator was a partially opened container of walnuts. But you could use any kind of nut that you liked, including, but not limited to, 
cashews. Although every time I say that word, somebody says, bless you. <laughs> you could also put mixed fruit in there if you wanted to. The holidays seem to get here earlier every year, so why not make a holiday fruitcake? There might be some relatives you haven't yet alienated. But with the two bowls combined together, we'll go ahead and mix all these ingredients. That'll take a little while and it's pretty boring to watch, so we'll turn the camera off and we'll come back when I've got it done and we're ready to go nuts. It is at this juncture that I'd like to point out just how far behind we've left the modern wimpy hand mixer. I don't know why these modern examples of hand mixers are all such garbage, but even though this old sunbeam is pretty roughed up, it's still getting the job done far better than a modern one ever would. And if you're wondering about the burst of power, there used to be a plastic guard on here, but this little stem that's poking out is what enables it. I don't know exactly what it does, but I suspect it might stick a capacitor in line with the motor somewhere to make the phase shift a little bit greater inside and cause it to run faster. But there you just saw a demonstration of that. My mother, meanwhile, is chopping up nuts over here. Or walnuts. There you go, folks. That's our nearly finished batter. The next thing to do is to go nuts. And I think I'll probably just fold those in by hand. There's no need to involve the mixer any longer. Although it's a little bit hard to tell, you should be able to see that there are definitely nuts in this batter, and the batter tastes absolutely incredible. So good, in fact, that it's a wonder we actually have any left to put into our two freshly prepared cake pans. In the name of preparing the cake pans, we went ahead and sprayed them down with non-stick spray. You can use Pam if you're particularly fancy. We use the finest stuff that Dollar General has to offer because, well, we're not so fancy. But there are both of our pans. The oven is over there preheating our very awesome 1971 Hot Point by General Electric. That is exactly the kind of stove I want to have when I grow up because I really love the layout of that thing. I don't really care about the dual ovens so much, but that work area off to the side of the burners is freaking awesome. So great is our commitment to you, the viewer, that we are making sure of our facts and figures before we tell you something that might be patently incorrect. They're eight by eight and a half, it looks like. When it comes to the pans you want to use, an eight by eight or nine by nine glass pan is more than acceptable. Whichever one you happen to have in your home is perfectly fine. We'll ignore the cake batter that I just got all over my fingers, not that it really matters because it's wonderful. What we need to focus our attention on now is getting the cake batter evenly divided between the two pans. And you could just kind of eyeball this and guesstimate it, but guess what? There is a better way. And if you call within the next 10 minutes, we'll send you a second one for free. We'll take our one cup measure. We had eggshells in this earlier, but we've rinsed it out and cleaned it really well. It's got a little nut residue in it now, but that's not going to hurt anything. And we'll label out somewhere around a cup of the batter. And we'll take that, we'll try not to get it all over ourselves and failing miserably, and we'll put it in the pan. And we might need to actually use our spatula for this. So there's one, approximately one cup of batter, give or take a little bit. I'm just waiting to set that dog alarm off. Alright, there's our first cup of batter. And we'll go back and we'll do the same thing. And we'll take it and we'll put it in our second pan here. And again, we'll try to clean it out with the spatula a little bit. You are going to get very, very dirty doing this. I know, I am. And you know what they say about a messy kitchen. A messy kitchen is a happy kitchen, and this kitchen is rapidly working its way up to delirious. I may have to take a shower after this might be a problem because I try to limit myself to no more than one or two of those a week. Can you imagine if you were making 50 of these things? 
I don't think there'd be enough laundry detergent in the world. These are our two filled cake pans, and now that we have filled them approximately equally with contents of the batter, we're mixing them up to assure even distribution of everything. We'll go ahead and do that with both pans. Our oven is over there preheating. Our oven is all ready to go. We have our temperature set to approximately 340 degrees or thereabouts. Here's our first cake. Go ahead and put that in the oven. Our oven light recently burned out. And yes, our oven needs badly to be cleaned. And now we'll set the timer for somewhere in the neighborhood of a half an hour or so. And because I do get some questions about this periodically, yes, over 45 years, well over 45 years after this stove was manufactured, that clock and timer still keep incredible time. Of course, it should be very accurate. It's a little line synchronous motor that operates it. And we actually do use the time bake facility every now and again. That's cake number two. Our oven is warming up once again. And we'll be back in about a half an hour to tell you how to check the doneness of these cakes. Man, that was good for a lot of dirty dishes. We're about midway through our cooking time. And in that time, the cakes have managed to start rising up quite nicely. All right, now, in order to find out whether or not these are done, We'll go ahead and we'll pull the oven rack out. I have a knife here. You can also do this with a toothpick. If you insert it in the center and it comes out clean, it's done. So we're not quite there yet. Oh, and in case anybody happens to be wondering about just how much cooking we do around here, this stove gets quite a workout. All right, let's try our little test again. We'll open the oven, pull the oven rack out. We're definitely getting closer, but we're not quite there yet. Here we are checking in on our cakes once again to find out whether or not they are done. Again, the knife needs to come out clean when inserted into the center of the cake. And that time around it did on the cake on the left. They're done. They are finally done at last. Now tempting though it may be to dig in and start eating your cake right away, and believe me it is extraordinarily tempting, you must let it cool first. Then after it has cooled, you can channel your inner Weird Al and eat it. Thank you as always for watching, and certainly do feel free to leave a constructive comment if you happen to have one. I'm always interested in hearing your views down in the comments area, and I'm certainly willing to answer your questions if you happen to have any. And if you try this yourself, please do let us know. We'd love to hear how it turned out for you. I almost forgot the most important part of making a cake, and that is the frosting. So what we're going to do now is we're going to make homemade frosting. Sure, you could buy it in a can at the store, but I think it tastes a lot better when you make it yourself. And follow along and you'll see how to do it. All right, it's back to me. My mother's very good at this sort of thing, but I'm here to save the day by completely screwing it up, or some similar metaphor that's exceedingly strained. What I'm going to do for your viewing pleasure now is complete the frosting recipe. And as previously mentioned, we have the softened butter, which is now more liquid butter, and the softened cream cheese in our bowl. To that, we are going to add some vanilla. So we've got that right here. And we need, how much of that do we need? A quarter of a teaspoon, but we're doubling the recipe. So we're going to want a half a teaspoon. And what do you know? There it is. We'll go ahead and pour that in there. And again, you really shouldn't hold this over your bowl, but I'm being careful. Okay, there's the vanilla. Now the next thing that we'll need is what they call confectioners, or powdered sugar. We actually have some of that right here. We'll get to that in just a moment, because we also need some cinnamon. How much cinnamon do we need? Well, it says half a teaspoon. There are two openings on this lid. One of them is a sifter style opening for pouring. The other one is for measuring. And here again, there's that straight edge that you can use to level off your measurement. 
So it says we need half a teaspoon, but again, we're doubling our recipe, so we're going to use one teaspoon of this. I'm going to try to get it in there, hopefully without spilling in too much of it. And we'll just run it right alongside there. There we go. Poof, there it goes. All right. So we have a little bit of confectioner's sugar here. And, and the way this works, this is kind of like guess and check math. You start out with a little bit of this, and you work with it until your frosting is of the consistency that you desire. I think this is the amount that I'm supposed to start with. Two cups. Two cups. So I need to pour out more. Okay. And I, again, you shouldn't really do this over your bowl. And I shouldn't be holding it like this because I'm just asking for the thing to decide it's going to flop over. We'll go until we've got about one cup here, and then we'll start another cup. That's pretty close. Mix. Put that in there. Mix, Mix it up. turning a lovely color. It'll go well with the cake. I'm sure you can probably hear my teleprompter back there. Alright, now we're going to do our second cup of powdered sugar. That's pretty close. Put that in there. And again, we'll start our mixer on kind of a low speed so that this stuff just doesn't go foof right into the air. So it doesn't do what? Go foof right into the air. It doesn't do what? <laughs> really, you think I'm going to do that a third time? It's not like the Pentium microprocessor. We don't want a foof bug to occur. See how many people in the viewing audience actually get that. I think that was a Pentium specific design flaw. So review the frosting ingredients, please. Okay. Cream cheese, unsalted butter, pure vanilla extract, confectioner's sugar and cinnamon. And if you're not doubling it, you want five ounces of the cream cheese, three tablespoons of the butter, a quarter teaspoon of the pure vanilla extract, just one cup of confectioner's sugar, and a half teaspoon of cinnamon. How's it taste? I don't know, Matt. <laughs> Exceptional. So there's our finished frosting going on to the first cake. It's easy to make. And really a lot better than the store-bought stuff. I guess you could say in a certain way it's a lot healthier too because there aren't all those weird ingredients in it. It's just cream cheese, confectioner sugar, and a few other things. No preservatives or anything. Now, as it just so happens, we actually made two of these cakes, one of them to take to a longtime friend, a neighbor of ours. My mother called to let them know that we're headed over that way right away, and they told us they'd been doing some baking as well, so it's a give one, get one kind of a deal. And here's what we got in return, some apple crisp. In the water. 